17,075 feet, an expedition in moments. 14,321 feet, I wake in a blur, in the abruptness of a moment. As my eyes try and focus, those are the first numbers I see. Altitude. My brain strains to make sense of the world around me. Catch yourself, just breathe. It's daylight, but not yet morning. Denali. Camp 3 is basked in the soft light of dawn, but there is no warmth yet to speak of. I wake to a dusting of ice on my face, to the silence of the morning. I drift back to sleep. 6,614 feet. The plane jolts with turbulence. My knuckles whiten as I squeeze the seat in front of me. Catch yourself, just breathe. An irrational act of survival, fear of the unknown. What would it be like, my last second to my first? That instant between breaths when you are inevitably cast upon an unknown voyage. I see a child in the seat next to me, her eyes ignited with the joy of life in this newfound world, oblivious to the millions of mechanized parts currently synchronized and the impracticality of maintaining a pressurized metal tube in flight. She is in bliss, in ecstasy, in the moment. I, on the other hand, am losing my breath just before impact. 17,075 feet. The numbers glare at me under frost. My lungs burn as I gasp for air. Catch yourself, just breathe. The seven millimeter cord between us stretched taut in the freezing wind, its yellow sheath a stark contrast to the ice-covered ridge below. I can't feel my hands, but I shake them anyways. The immediacy of descent paramount. At that moment, in many, I feel alive. We descend towards safety, little humans cast upon that mountain ridge. 20 feet. Steam from my mug rises swiftly in the cold sea air. The feeling of the Pacific between my toes. I walk the beach and lose myself in the dance of seagulls, in the crashing of waves, and in the warmness of my summer skin. I do not know if it's my mind, my life, or my climbing that reminds me of the impermanence of what I've made, of life or of moments. I feel fortunate, though, to be reminded of the fragility of life, to be thrust headlong into adventure, to lose myself in the little things, in the moments between breath and breathing, or the scattering of dawn across snow, in labored muscles and perfectly balanced ice tools, in the sag of Hilleberg guy lines at dusk or grain snacks filled with snow, in the feeling of aged paper pressed just between my thumb and forefingers, there's just enough moisture to separate the pages but not smear the ink, the unconscious progression of futures into pasts. There's something about the presence of mind that is created in the pursuit of mountains, that for better or worse spills over into all aspects of my life. Maybe it's the change of glaciers over the summer months, or the change of friends or of lovers. Maybe it's the change of self, voyage after voyage into those sacred lands. Maybe. Or maybe it's in capturing moments and in letting them go. 1775, An Expedition in Moments, by George Beaker. Hello and welcome to Mountain Talk, the first episode here with your host, George Beaker. If you've made it this far, thank you. I started this episode off with a poem that I wrote while I was on Denali because this episode talks a lot about Alaska and how it's impacted me. I started guiding there in 2018 and just recently, as of April of 2022, have accepted a lead guide position with the American Alpine Institute. So I will be leading Expedition 4 this year and I'm super excited. So Denali's been on my mind and I started this podcast with an excerpt of a poem that I wrote and this podcast is an interview where we talk a lot about Alaska. This podcast is a recast of an interview that I had with Chelsea Mern in October of 2021. It covers a lot of subjects, who I am, what I'm about, and where I'm going, and so I figured it would probably be the best to start my podcast with a little bit of background on myself for those of you who do not know. Before we get started with the interview that I had with Chelsea, a little bit of housekeeping. Now, this is the first podcast I have ever attempted to produce. This is the first time I've recorded audio, cleaned audio, edited audio, and produced it. If you have any advice, tips, and tricks, if you can let me know how to overlay some music into this, please reach out on Patreon or Instagram at George Beaker, B-I-E-K-E-R. And if you're not already a subscriber to my Patreon, www.patreon.com slash George Beaker, I would love your support. Um, it's the people who support me now that have given me the idea to create this podcast and who fund me to continue producing content. Enough about the Patreon. A little bit of housekeeping on my life. 
I've kind of checked out of Instagram, social media, and producing content for about the past six weeks because I lost both of my parents. It's been a lot, and um, I'm just now getting back into the swing of things. So more to come on that. I just wanted to mention that because I'm not ghosting everyone for no reason. Without further ado, let's start the interview with Chelsea. And thank you for listening. Excited to have my friend on today. We have George Beaker. He is a guide, a climber, and honestly, a huge inspiration to me. I'm so excited for you guys to hear from him. So, George, go ahead and introduce yourself to my audience. Awesome. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, my name is George Beaker, like Chelsea mentioned, uh, originally from Arkansas. I'm 33 years old. Um, I have an undergraduate in recreation and sport management and a master's in education from the University of Arkansas. And I currently guide full time in the Pacific Northwest in the summers and Colorado in the winters is what I do for my quote unquote full time job, part time seasonal job. And then I work uh, as a co founder and coach for a company, Summation Athletics, and we do remote coaching all over the place. Um, that's what I'm doing currently, I guess. I love it. I love it. So you're <laughs> really immersed in the climbing world. I mean, both of your jobs are your coach and you're a guide. So when was the point that you kind of realized like, okay, I have a master's in education. Like maybe I don't want to go that traditional route. And I do want to explore the co- climbing side of things a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, no, perfect. Um, it actually is probably better to start at the beginning of my climbing career. Um, I had no idea what rock climbing was or any sort of climbing was until my sophomore year of college, I believe it was. And this was 2010. And I walked in to do a CrossFit at workout and there was a bouldering competition going on. So naturally I went in for the free food. And the next day I started bouldering in the climbing gym at the university. And for two years, I was uh, a pad person uh, in the outdoor program. And so that introduction got me a job at the outdoor program um, and kind of shifted my perspective in undergraduate and opened up doors that I didn't know existed. And so I kind of pursued outdoor trip leading and uh, my bachelor's at the same time. And when I graduated, right before I graduated my bachelor's, I had required a certification of some sort. And so I took our introductory course here at the American Alpine Institute in 2012 as a student. And I think that was probably the first time when I was like introduced to, hey, I can take this passion of climbing and I can educate people and teach them at the same time and kind of uh, hopefully mature those transformational experiences um, along the way. And then I kind of got swindled into a master's. I I use swindle in a a uh, non-negative sense, in a good way. Um, And when I finished my master's in education, all I really cared to try to do was guide for the American Alpine Institute full-time. And that was 2017. And so I applied here and started that that professional sort of uh, business side of guiding and education and climbing all mixed together. Right. So you kind of always knew that was what you wanted to do. And then, so where did the coaching side of things come in? Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Uh, I forgot about that completely. Um, so during either my master's or undergraduate degree, um, I met an individual, Scott Ferguson. He's also the other co-founder at Summation. And we did a conference at in Arkansas at AOR, uh, the Arkansas Association, no, wait, the Association of Outdoor Recreation Education is a conference uh, for colleges around like the Midwest and South. And so we did a remote built a presentation on basically mountain training, uh, building an aerobic base and practical applications. So Scott is studying or was studying at the time his doctorate in physiology. And I was already pretty involved in guiding and education and just being outdoor as a climber uh, as well. And so we kind of joined forces and made this presentation and uh, like 70 people showed up. We were kind of like, whoa, what is this? Kind of fell apart a uh, little ways. Like he had to finish his doctorate and then we kind of came back together after he had interned for Uphill Athlete. Um, they kind of want to brought him on as a coach, but he was too busy in his doctoral program to be like, I can't do this. So I'm going to step away. And so 
he stepped away and had to bolster his athletic resume. So like a coach has to bolster their profile of athletes that they've done or worked with. And so he was like, can I train you for um, a year or two years? And so we had this great connection. He trained me for through a multiple programming processes, um, working on Denali and things like that. And then finally, we just thought it was a good idea to start a company together because he basically trained me via <laughs> the work and uh, I learned along the way. And so now I hope I help other people do a similar thing as well. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot that you have to do in order to get ready for <laughs> the types of adventures uh, that you go on. One thing that really has stood out to me about you is you taught me this concept of, okay, we're just going to do this 45 minute base building. And for me, I, like, I remember we'd go on runs and you're like, you can walk uphill. And I was like, no, I need to slowly run up this hill. And you're like beating me walking, like introduce this <laughs> concept of just 45 minutes. You don't have to go the distance. You don't have to do anything else. Like you're just trying to build this base. So mm -hmm. when you work with athletes trying to get them prepared, like what are some of the main things that you help them focus on? I think uh, as a general rule for me in helping individuals in any aspect is uh, understanding behavioral modification. Um, basically, how can we reinforce things that seem in the short term to be negative for positive outcomes in the future? And so something very simple like the aerobic base that we're talking about right now is making the process so easy or so enjoyable that you'll actually commit to doing it over extended periods of time. Because the whole issue with training instead of exercise is really the commitment to the long duration. Um, even if you see marketed decreases in performance throughout the process, you're basically, yeah. And so basically you use the term rewiring a lot, which I, I extremely like, um, reinforcing these habits so that you get into a different perspective during whatever it is. And lots of people I coach have a very, uh, a very what do I want to use what word do I want to use perfectionist no um disposition towards intensity in workouts like mm -hmm. you like you were coming coming to say like what changed the game for me personally was understanding that there is a clock and not a mileage counter on my aerobic building and so instead of running for five miles say I have a five mile run on Thursday I changed that qualitative or quantitatively to 1.5 hours of duration. And just that change of perspective met, lets me approach it in, I need to work for a 1.5 hours of sustainable exertion rather than I'm going to run five miles as fast as I can to get the damn workout over with. And so nothing comes quickly. And so just having time in the saddle um, is the, how I would like to phrase it usually is the whole process. So understanding that you can go slower to maintain certain heart rate zones will actually benefit you in the long term, even in those short, intense circumstances. Yeah, because I remember you'd be like smoking me at the end of the run because I went out like way too fast in the beginning. And you're like, you got to stay in the heart rate zone. And I was like, yeah. no, I'll be fine. Like it really like it made the run and I like still do this to this day. I'm like, I don't have to do any amount of time. I'm just going for distance and it is so much more enjoyable. Like I enjoy running so much more now. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that, that's great. And one thing that once basically anyone I work with from a coaching perspective, uh, at least for summation for the first eight or 16 weeks, I'm just going to see if you're committed to the, pro the process and try to reinforce habits that allow you to to perform for those eight to 16 weeks to 80 plus percent of your workouts, right? And if we can get through that, then we have a long ways to go from there. Um, but people who have maybe a higher aerobic base to start with, who find those workouts quite easy, the last 10% of the work to make it spice it up or to like give yourself a more like a, oh, I did something with this workout, so it feels better, I've got an endorphin dump, is basically like, if I know I'm 10% done, I'll just up the pace faster and faster and faster and faster and faster until I get done. And then it feels good because I get that endorphin dump of like, oh, I did some, I did some hit workouts. So it feels like I get a better return on investment, but it's actually a, yeah, false, false positive. Um, you're going to get more bang for your buck if you can do lower intensity for longer durations and keep that 
uh, slowly building over time than you will doing a whole bunch of short, high intensity work. Right. I'm so glad we're talking about this too, because I think there might be a lot of people, I mean, myself included, that would be interested in doing bigger, longer trips and excursions. But you look at the end destination, the goal, and you're like, how would I even get there? You know, so it's like we're talking about kind of how to break it down and we're talking about getting prepared for doing things like this. So when people have, you know, big objectives in mind, let's say Denali, I mean, I don't know if that's like super, super advanced or anything, but we can even break it down a little bit further than that. You know, let's say somebody were interested in starting to branch out of, okay, yep, you know, I've, I've bouldered before, I've sport climbed, I've done a little trad climbing, like I do want to take things to the next level and I really want to spend some time in the mountains what would you kind of suggest for somebody like that Mm, I mean as like a a shotgun response uh just a gut response to that is actually pay to get some educate like mountain education uh just so that you can approach these bigger areas in a safer or a less risky management management uh from a risk management perspective just because um but we're dealing with two spheres of thought here and on my right hand, I'm thinking of like physical exertion. Am I capable of doing what's required? And day after day, uh, do I have the fitness capable? Mm-hmm. And then on the other hand, I have the mental sphere of things, um, the technical complex systems that you have to use to manage safety in that terrain. Um, the objective risk management uh, is the mountain falling on me or can I fall in the mountain? And those two spheres are wildly digressive. Um, So you can train in one completely and be highly capable. Um, But ideally, we want to train in both of those simultaneously to a certain degree. And I feel like that's my job as a professional when I take people out is to assess them in those two categories and then thread that line and let them learn along the progression of also increasing in one or two of those categories or both simultaneously. Um, And so for someone who wanted to get into something like that or some of these more bigger, more committing objectives, I would say one, take care of the fitness component because that's something you can always prepare for and you can always do in your own time. You can get a coach. You can. There's so many resources online. Um, but basically, I can put in the work now for the return on investment later. So, th- so that whole physical side, I don't have to worry about anymore. All I have to focus on is the mental side of things. And when I am able to do that, I can be clearer and more safe in those environments. When I'm having to juggle both of those at the same time is when things go back. Or can do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm again, I'm so glad we're talking about this because me, I would totally just jump to the physical aspect. Like, am I physically capable? Mm-hmm. And I would probably very soon run into, oh shit, there's this whole other side, the, the technical component that I am just not ready for. So yeah, like hiring somebody mm-hmm. to really help with that, I think, I mean, that's the safest route anyway. Mm-hmm. Is like, yeah. let's maybe just not try to DIY this and just go out and see what happens. Like, I mean, yeah, that's that's essentially your life that you're playing with at that point. Yeah. And then, it, I mean, for people who have more experience, maybe, um, maybe you're a competent, so let's just hypothetically say you're a competent 512 trad leader and you've never done bigger objectives. Well, what you do is you just dial back the intensity of the objective you're going for so that the mental aspect of the mountain itself isn't something you have to worry about um, on the fly. So maybe you go for like a 5.7, a traditional Alpine 5.7 climb, where the climbing is so easy for you that you don't have to worry about the physicality. All you have to worry about is the mental part, and then progress that over time. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, you can always build a base. (laughs) We talked about running, and everybody can benefit from high aerobic output or not high intensity aerobic output but the ability to deliver outputs in the aerobic zone for a long period of time Mm -hmm. yeah a lot of um duration i would Mm -hmm. say like longer longer periods of time So, okay, I definitely want to talk about Alaska. So you just finished, I mean, probably at this point, what, like maybe a month or more ago, two trips to Alaska, to Denali. One you were guiding, one was a more personal trip. So let's talk about the the guiding trip first. So how was that experience for you? Uh, I remember when you were telling me about this, I'm like, wait, you're going to do what? Like, you're just going to get like 
dropped off and like how I'm in my mind I'm like how do you survive <laughs> yeah no no it's good yeah um uh, yeah uh from I guess early May mid-May till early July I was primarily uh in the Alaska range on Denali um like Chelsea said for work at the beginning and for play at the end um so a Denali expedition Denali is the highest mountain in North America and for a guided expedition, there's 10 companies who work on the mountain and their itineraries are generally the same, about 21 days of time of climbing time. And for the guides, we're probably in the area for about 28 days uh, with prep work before and after the trip. And so um, the West Buttress trip starts in Talkeetna, Alaska, like 300 feet uh, above sea level. And then you take a bush plane um, to the Cahilton Glacier, which is about 7,000 feet of elevation. And they drop you off there for your 21 day trip. Uh, and the summit is at 20,700 feet or something like that. And so you spend the next 21 days uh, moving your crew, which a full Denali expedition is nine clients and three guides for the American Alpine Institute, 12 people um all the way from 7000 feet to almost 21000 feet to try to climb Denali that's so impressive it's it's so impressive and i mean not only are you having to do the physical work yourself but you're guiding and you're you know potentially like help i don't want to say taking care of other people but like you're definitely yeah you're in a very supportive you're, role yeah mhm mm no i mean uh that's that type of work for me is traditional guiding work uh, what you would think of if you see like someone in Chamonix short roping someone up a, a cliff band. Um, you are there for both uh, protection, safety, um, you're a counselor. Um, you do sometimes have to babysit people. I, I had to put uh, individuals mittens on their hands and dress them because they, they ended up having frostbite on their hands because they just couldn't take care of themselves in that environment. And so that was an actual act of like, I need to actually dress this person because they can't do it. Uh, or something bad's gonna happen, and so 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 there is some of that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So okay, from what I remember, you guys actually I don't think you reached the summit on that first trip. Tell me more about that. Correct. Yeah. Um, so, oh, in on Denali, traditionally the season is uh, May, June, July, for most like guided parties and or recreational parties. May is cold. I mean, we're talking negative. 17 is 17,000 feet is at least negative 40 ish. Uh, and then plus wind chill could be really, really cold. Um, at 14,000 feet, we'd wake up to negative 15 or so degrees Fahrenheit, uh, multiple days. And so it's a lot of snow and snow continues to precip traditionally in the climate. And then as you progress over just three months of time, the later season is generally longer systems of high pressure, but also lots of wind. And so there's multiple dynamics you have to deal with. And probably the biggest outside of the physical factor of Denali is the weather. And so for that first trip, we actually got stuck for a week at 11,000 feet because of snowfall and wind speeds. And then again at uh, 14,000 feet. So we lost 14, almost 14 days of time just due to weather. And so we basically, at that point, the, the clock is just ticking. And so you have to leave at a certain point because if you have a low pressure system come in and you have a window to leave, you may miss the gap that you take all your flights and things like that because you're not really sure how long the duration of the storms can last. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like there's a so lot. Of basically, it was just weather. Yeah. 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 Like going into it, you kind of never know what to expect. Like, sure, you can have like a loose plan and everything, but ultimately, like, it's not up to you. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And um, Denali in particular typically draws individuals who are very goal oriented. Um, it is one of the seven summits, so one of the highest peaks on every continent. And so you get people who are uh, have done well successfully in a professional job or people who are uh, goal setters who want to check a box. And so they come to the, the Denali experience with that mindset and learn quickly that things like that just don't work out in the bigger ranges. And I think that's a great lesson for people who are climbers. Um, in our pre-trip meeting, everybody talks about like expectations. And for me, it's like transformational experiences. Regardless if we get anywhere, there could be moments where uh, it's the process that changes your life, not the actual getting to the top. 
because on my private trip, we did summit, like just personally in some of the worst weather, I would not do this again, but <laughs> at the summit, it's like uh, 30 seconds on, we were on our knees huddled together and just like, oh, we're going to snap a selfie and you can't see anything. It's like, that doesn't even matter. Right. The whole process of getting <laughs> up and coming down changes your life and being on top of a mound of dirt really doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't for me anymore. Yeah, that's, I mean, honestly, that's one of my favorite things about you. That's one of the things that I love the most about you is you remind me that it's not, it's not about the end destination. Like it truly is the process and like learning to enjoy that more because otherwise, like, what's the point you get? Yeah. This 30 second little window where you're like, yay, I did the thing. Now what? Where in totally. reality, yeah, it's the, the entire lead up beforehand. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very, I've been heavily influenced uh, by both like Buddhism or Zen or things like that. It's, it's very much the be here now, because if, it, if it's the goal or the destination that you want to get to, once you're there, you're going to have to look for something else. So it's always seeking and grasping and looking. Whereas if you find equanimity or like uh, the process that provokes the most joy, then it's the process that you'll seek. And you'll just become the thing that you want to be rather than just being like jumping from goal to, to goal. Right. I, I, I think it's, I think it's a more, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say eloquent, but I think it's a more um, enjoyable ultimately way to, to process things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been having a lot of conversations similar to this lately, I think, because I'm probably going through my own, um, trying to like detach um, from my performance in climbing. So I always find it really interesting when I feel like I'm like, wow, this person, like they, they kind of nailed it. Have you always had this view with climbing or was it something that, you know, at a certain point you kind of recognized, okay, I kind of want to do things different. Hmm. Um, I think I've had a predisposition towards play as a human throughout my entire life, for sure. Uh, and climbing definitely right when I started it allowed me to play effortlessly. And so my connection with the, the actual activity of climbing started as the pure process of the activity as bouldering. There's nothing else, right? It's just physicality and, <clears throat> and technique, uh, the pure probably like, I mean, you would say probably the purest form of climbing, which is not untrue. Um, and that quickly, I don't know, it's hindsight is such an interesting thing because we think of ourselves as a history, right? I'm not the same person I was when I started. And so I can't be informed as they were. So now I just look back at the things that I did and I'm like, oh, well, the me now thinks X, which is totally fabrications. Um, I think for me, the mountain environment has probably played the biggest role in changing that perspective over the long term, because I've been in the mountains for very long periods of time now. I mean, I guess I've spent at least like five summers of my life, basically just mountain guiding and knowing that you don't have, you're powerless in that environment, uh, that there's things that are outside of your control is very a humbling experience and I think it rubs off in the long term if you're if you're in those environments it's the same thing with any activity that takes you into wilderness areas and I think at initially what drew me to more of like an, an outdoor learning experience rather than the traditional classroom setting the ability to connect with people deeply and intimately very quickly in these remote settings uh, did the same for me as I'd like to do for other people and I don't even know if that answered the question at all, but. <laughs> I think it did. I mean, I think it did. And so I don't know if I've told you this, but you are hugely inspirational to me in the way that you live your life where you, you know, you have these periods of time where you work and you guide and you do these things, but then you also like, it's a huge priority for you to have time off to do what you want to do. And I'm like, oh my God, I want that. Like, that's kind of what I've always been chasing. It's just taken me like so long to actually get there. So, you know, you live a very unconventional lifestyle. You live in a van, you work when you want to work. Like, tell me how that's been for you to kind of go against, um, conformity actually like just yeah like you know not saying like I'm not going to have the nine to five job like has that been mm -hmm. difficult for you um honestly it started uh very early like when I changed my 
I can remember distinctly when I changed my uh, undergraduate, I was in the, uh, you know, the degree office or whatever, the advisor's office. And I was literally changing my degrees from, I don't know, I probably had five different changes before then to outdoor <laughs> recreation. And I was a, a philosophy major at the time of the change. And I just remember thinking to myself, well, I could be poor and live indoors, or I could be poor and live outdoors. <laughs> and I can always read books from dead old white dudes, probably. And so I just remember tw- switching to outdoor recreation. And I think for me, it goes back to the play in me. It's like I, I can't fake myself into doing something that I'm not vested in as a human. And so I'm, a, I'm very bad at faking. If, if anybody ever meets me in person, uh, I can't lie. I mean, you'll read instantly on my face, <laughs> it's true. whatever it is. And so um, I think for me, the seasonal lifestyle worked very well when I started it. Uh, basically, my, my typical calendar right now is about May, uh, May-ish, May to June is Alaska. And then I come back and do July, August, September in the Cascades, working for the American Alpine Institute or other companies, guiding. Then I'll take off uh, typically October, November, maybe even some of December, depending on. And I do random other things, right? I'm uh, remote fitness coaching, so I have some income coming there. And some other opportunities working for media generation for companies. Uh, kind of, I have my hands in a lot of pots to kind of supplement my income. Then in the winter, I work for in Ure, Colorado, doing ice and mix guiding for about three months, take a month off, and then go back to, to guiding. And um, I think for me, it's worked out really well because I have to prioritize self-care, what it is that I'm doing. I have, I have to progress in every aspect of my life, not just my physical aspect, not just my professional aspect, but I need to progress uh, emotionally in but I need to progress emotional intelligence and things like that. And that takes other avenues of pursuits. And so having the time, making, dedicating time in my life to pursue other things, um, may, basically for me, just keeps life more interesting and allows me to progress faster as a human. And maybe that's why I chose the more non-traditional aspect um, just because when I when I think of the traditional aspect of things, I just think about that that nine to five uh, <laughs> Monday through Friday, which I mean I, I opened a gym in San Diego during quarantine. I mean I was the general manager and hired and interviewed and brought a whole team together and did the nine to five basically, and it was a great learning experience. Um, <laughs> also during COVID, which is crazy. Um, but for me, it kind of took away a little bit from why I climb. And it's actually the pursuit of having to be in these wild places and travel and climb and things like that. And the seasonal or non-traditional lifestyle allows me to do that the most, I think. Yeah, totally. Oh, I love it. I love We're it. We're always learning. We're always learning. No, no one's ever there. It's always like, I mean, we, we've climbed a lot together. You're never strong. You can always be stronger. You can always be fitter you can always be smarter there the boundary the horizon of learning is always just where you perceive it to be and then it's further right yeah. mm-hmm. I was talking to my mentor earlier actually about like kind of this obsession that we have with like the destination and reaching it and she's like the destination is death and I was like oh that's fucking actually you're correct and I was like yeah, I don't need to be speeding towards that anytime soon, you know? So it's like, it really reiterates, like it's the process. And it's like, I think for me, what I want people to take away from this is like, if you're doing the nine to five thing and like you have other interests, other goals, other whatever it is, like you can make a lifestyle that fits and works for you. Like it is out there and people have done it before. Yeah, no, I I think uh, I would, I would rebuttal and say, uh, that life would be the destination, uh, only because of some things, but, uh, we won't go there yet. Um, but I would say that there's the sunken cost fallacy essentially. So you're, you're in, let's just say you are, let's, this is random. Uh, we're going to buy a dishwasher (laughs) talking about non-traditional. I'm never going to have a dishwasher in my life, probably, but we're going to buy a dishwasher. 
and we spend $400 on our dishwasher. And then later we see an ad for a dishwasher for $275. And so in our minds, we probably are gonna go through this process of thinking about the pros and cons of the situation that we already made, right? And the sunken cost fallacy is you eliminate all that because the choice has already been made, right? It, you, your return on investment is lower the more you ponder on those things. And so I like to think of a twist on that is the sinking cost fallacy, which is you haven't made the decision yet. You're stuck in the perpetual, I am interested in this thing, but I don't know if I could do it professionally. Where am I getting income? And basically you never make the choice. You're just stalling and pros and conning the whole time. Yep. And I think that's ultimately worse. Um, if you make the wrong decision and you think about it, sure, but you actually made the decision. If you're in your head about if I should or shouldn't make the decision, <laughs> a, a part of me, I mean, at a certain point, my job and when I interact with people is hopefully push them to the side where they actually want to be genuinely. Um, but just pick something. Yes. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, ultimately, you have to invest energy and time and mind space into the things that you want to do. And so thinking about doing the thing is not doing the thing. At a certain point, you have to just start doing the thing. Mm -hmm. And other things may fall and life always happens. It's not like <laughs> if I didn't have any problems, it's like, oh, hunky dory for the rest of my life. Life wouldn't be fun. It, it wouldn't be challenging. It wouldn't be worth living. The reason it's worth living is because these problems keep popping up. It's because we have uh, a new friendship or any any host of both good or evil things. Evil. There's no mor morals here. <laughs> good or bad to my perspective. Um, but that's what makes it interesting. So something bad is going to happen even if you do the thing that you've always wanted to do, guaranteed. Mm -hmm. But it's if you really want to do the thing you wanted to do, then you'll, you'll just, you'll pick up the ball and you'll just keep rolling with it. Yeah, exactly. Like you'll, you'll make it happen. And one thing that I like really want to pull out of what you just said is kind of this whole concept of like the, the energy behind deciding to do something, mm -hmm. putting all of your energy behind that, because once you do so many doors will open, it's almost saying like, I've decided this, so I'm not available for that anymore. And like, I mean, I'm sure once you decided like, yep, I'm going to do the guiding things, like you probably got a whole host of opportunities. And all of a sudden it was like, wow, okay, this is a real mm -hmm. thing. Like I'm going to do this. It's going to, it's going to become a reality. Totally. I mean, I think it's, it's both, I would term, I mean, like it's manifesting, you know, I mean, it's not, for me, it's not really manifesting. I like the word because I like what it entails, but also when we, when we make these choices or we head towards certain things, our both intimate knowledge of the subject and our locus of perspective hones in on whatever it is that we're pursuing. And that in turn, allows us to recognize patterns in this new way of thought that we might see things that we wouldn't even have seen previously, even though they were there. Mm -hmm. And so it's really just attention. It's all about attention. <laughs> and the more, and the more you do the thing that you want to do, be it climbing or whatever, the more you're going to notice within that niche, more subtleties to the thing that you're doing. That's going to make you more of an expert. The more, you know, the more, you know, you don't know. And this applies in every category of life. Um, if, if, if you're inquisitive in any, in any degree, which I couldn't <laughs> imagine people not being, I mean, there are people who aren't, but I don't know. I don't know what I they're not listening to this show. No. Yeah, they're definitely not listening to this. <laughs> Let me rant on about whatever it is. <laughs> it. We have the inquisitive ones here. So okay. yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, this has been this has been so great. So okay, I want to know about for you, one of your favorite moments guiding, and then one of your favorite moment, moments, I mean, it can be recent, it can be just like something that felt really life-changing for you, like in your own personal climbing. So something that just like holds a lot of meaning for you in both of those areas. Nice. Uh, it might be just as you were talking about it, but actually instantly both of the experiences that I hold were both on Denali, which is funny, uh, and both in different different regards. So this might have been 2018, my first, I think that was my first Denali expedition working. And it was <clears throat> two or 3 a.m. in the morning. And during the sun 
during the summers in Alaska, the sun doesn't ever set. Uh, it, it basically will go behind the ranges, but it goes towards the horizon and just spins at um, in the middle of the night. So you don't bring headlamps, you don't bring masks, you don't bring anything. Uh, you actually bring masks just to go to sleep, uh, which is quite funny and it, it takes some time to get used to. But regardless, we were at 11,000 feet in a snowstorm and myself and Jim and Chad had to take turns. Every hour, one of us was up shoveling the tents. So basically the snowfall wouldn't suffocate either the clients or ourselves. And so, I mean, the snow was falling at an extremely rapid rate. And so every three hours I had to wake up, but every hour one of us was awake. And so it might've been two or three in the morning and it was my shift. And it was the Alpen glow, like a ombre of like orange and pinks and reds. And the, the snow was just dumping. And just the way that the dawn glistened the snowflakes through the air um, is a moment that I was working and I'll never forget for sure. Um, it was it was one of those moments of presence where you're like, I am here now, and this is what it is all about right now in the moment, and nothing else matters. And it had nothing to do with climbing or anything like that. It was literally just the moment. And it can happen anywhere, anytime. And I had multiple times this happens, but I pulled that one out because I was working and it was like a very present moment for me. And I, I, I just stick with that one. And then the second moment was the whole personal expedition on um, Denali with my friend Nick from Arkansas who's a firefighter and Cameron, a uh, previous uh, client who I met at American Alpine Institute, who's now a good friend. We climbed a lot together. Um, <clears throat> that trip was very much a transformational experience for me. In regards to, I was in those elements with people whom I was my truest form of myself and they were too, back to me. And so I, I actually had this compliment on a previous uh, Denali expedition is a, an Asian man, doctor told me like, you're one of the most genuine people I've ever met. And I was like, whoa, that's like quite the compliment. I didn't react like that. but. <clears throat> I, I was taken aback and I was glad to be because that, that's what I strive to be. But um, this personal trip with Nick and Cameron, there were so many aspects where we just showed who we were to each other continuously through the whole process that it allows me a different person. It was almost like a, uh, a paradigm shift where it's like I come out of this experience and I'm like, oh, I could just be this way all the time. And it sounds, I, I'm not sure what it sounds like, honestly, but for me as the experience, it was like very much one of those confluence of times where you're like, I can't believe this is happening and it, and it is happening, which is, is good. And I'm aging too. So, you know, I'm almost 34, so maybe it's that too. We'll see. <laughs> no, I remember, <laughs> like, I, I remember having this conversation with you too. I'm like, oh, when you go to guide, do you like put on your professional hat and you're like, no, I'm exactly the way that I am now. And I'm like, that's fucking awesome. Like you literally <laughs> be this authentic expression of yourself all the time, which, I mean, you were wondering how it sounds. And I think it gives a lot of people permission, honestly, because I mean, especially because I work with women, like we feel like we have to be a certain way in one situation and then in a different one. And there's it's all this like disconnect. And then at the end of the day, you just end up feeling like, who the fuck am I even? Mm -hmm, and like, it's mm -hmm. just so confusing sometimes. No, and I think I think um, we get caught in those traps a lot, be it men or women. Um, who am I? It's it's a it's a bad question. <laughs> I mean, it, I don't mean that towards you, but I think in general, it's like it's a bad question because when you're thinking about what it is, who you are, what what is my true self, you automatically create the dichotomy by asking the question because your reference frame is asking to a version of yourself that you're, you're, you're not anymore, right? Because you couldn't look at yourself and try to define what it is without taking a step back from yourself. So it, it, it leads you down the wrong rabbit holes, I think. Um, <laughs> who you are is what you do in every aspect of what it is. It's just, I, I love this thought problem, or I, I read this Alan Watts. I, I've read a lot of Alan Watts and other things, but um, one of these paraphrases that he mentioned some Zen master saying is, uh, I wish I knew the I that knows me, because then I, kn I could know 
that I know that I know, right? And it's an endless regression. And it, I don't know, it's just, it's a bad, it's a hard question to answer because there is no answer. That's why it's a bad question. And I can understand changing yourself depending on what you need to do, right? I do have a, the first day I show up to uh, my, my attendees for whatever program I'm running, uh, we have like a pre-trip meeting. And of course, in that regard, I am probably my most professional self. I'll, I'll typically not use any sort of um, gender exclusive language or um, references, pop culture references, or any sorts of things that would be red flags for individuals because I'm there to create a safe space, right? And, and that's me putting on a face in a sense to protect everyone in the group, to show themselves as genuinely as they can. And then hopefully change the environment to foster everyone to do this along the way, right? Sh decide that this is a safe place and I can do whatever it is that I feel like I should do. Um, <laughs> and Man, if you're trying to answer the question of who I am, um, I think my best, my, my advice right now is try to just do the things that bring you here now and not the things that make you ponder about what it is that I should or should be doing in a future that I haven't lived yet or in a past that I already lived and I was a different person. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, that's a ridiculously hard question. I mean, so we've mm -hmm. talked about you know, reasons for climbing for you anyway, is like this concept of like chasing presence. And then also a big part of it is, you know, the journey, not necessarily all of these end goals, but for you, like when you think about climbing and kind of like the role that it plays in your life and maybe even like a more extended role, like in the world or the universe, like, mm -hmm. why is it that you like are so drawn to climbing? Like, what is it about it? Mm. I think for me, it probably comes back to a, a, a confluence of those two spheres that we initially started talking about. Um, the physical aspect um, of the process of doing something. Um, I, I played American football in high school and it's funny. I mean, I loved the experience because it was an avenue where you both uh, increase your physical capacity with weightlifting and things like that. But you also were rewarded almost uniquely, I think, um, rewarded for your intensity on the, the field, right? The, the, the more intensity that I brought, the more aggression that I released was actually um, cheered, right? Because like that's, that's the object is to be as physical as you possibly can. And so climbing has that whole aspect. Typically, it's not towards someone else. It's towards the environment or um, a rock climb, which you never run out of things that you can't climb. And so that boundary can always be there and always be pushed, the physicality of the thing. And then climbing, I don't know if it's not unique 100%, but in the mental side of things, there's so many different avenues that come natural to the endeavor, be it cultural. Um, like travel to different locations, uh, different cultures, different humans. Um, it's an intimate relationship with other people because you literally tie in and trust your life to other people very quickly. So it's an intimate relationship with vastly different people um, <clears throat> that allows you to open your perspective in that regard. And then there's the whole mental aspect of yourself where most people come to the mountains to conquer the mountain, right? Um, you quickly realize that you're not conquering the mountain, you're conquering yourself and all the doubts that you have, or you're, you're am I ready for this? You're, the real battle is with yourself. Um, so you get the progression of uh, intellectual or psychotherapy almost um, that comes along with climbing <clears throat> as well. And then finally, not finally, but another aspect would be um, the whole te technological aspect or like uh, the mountain safety like um, the whole problem solving with ropes and crampons and the more craft side of guiding that I very much enjoy uh, complex problem solving and complex dynamic terrain. And so it has lots to offer in, in different hemispheres of progression and stimulation, which is, 
I think why I've stick, like stuck with it for so long. Yeah. Probably. And I don't see ever not doing it, honestly. Mm-hmm. There's so it much. Was, bouldering was the gateway drug. <laughs> <laughs> and now look at me. <laughs> and now look at how much I've grown. I know every time we yeah, talk, right? you're, you're so expansive for me because you're like, but there's ice climbing and there's trad and there's like mountaineering. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, there's not just bouldering and sport climbing. <laughs> I, I'm so glad that we had this discussion because I mean, I, I've just mentioned this, but like, I'm trying to really move away from the performance aspect of climbing. And there's so many other aspects that you can focus on, focus on the relationships, focus on the systems. Like there's just so much more just beyond the, the physical side of it. So, okay. One more question for you. So what's something right now that you're really into? This could be a book. Um, it could be a food. It could be like a random workout. Like, what are you into right now? Interesting. Um, well, I'll throw a couple things out there. Um, <clears throat> I am a huge Colin McCarthy fan. I typically read that fiction uh, almost primarily. I stumbled upon a Jeff Vindemere book book Annihilation uh, which is also a Natalie Portman movie and it's a trilogy and so I actually have been devouring that it's like a sci-fi um, psychedelic-esque uh, fiction fiction novel it's also like a slightly psychological thriller so that's kind of cool um, the scary aspects is what you don't know and so it, it kind of like plays on the the, sh the shadow side of the world um, so anybody can create what it is that they're most scared of <laughs> So that has been a really intriguing read. Um, the Making Sense podcast is always my number one podcast. It's a Sam Harris podcast, and it's very much science-based um, and illuminating in so many different regards. Uh, I can't recommend that one enough. Um, and then finally, I think I'm really interested in trying to push my traditional climbing grade. <laughs> uh, and be a 511 climber at index Woo -woo. yeah oh that sounds that like just gives me we'll chills just thinking about it yeah. oh, God. <laughs> you know fun, the funny thing about index is i think it's the one place in the world that i can think of right now that the rope grades are harder than the bouldering grades <laughs> you might be right <laughs> i mean i mean it's like it's ridiculous honestly it's pretty great. taking sandbagging to like a whole oh it's level. it's oh it's it's amazing yeah it's just a very uh a very hum a huge shout out to chelsea for having me on her podcast back in october i think the content there was illuminating for my subscribers because it tells a little bit more about me and i don't like talking about myself so thanks chelsea if you're interested in more of her content head over to instagram expand chelsea is her handle and her website is ladybetacoaching.com. She is a climbing coach and a business coach. A huge shout out to my Patreon subscribers for allowing me to produce this content and for giving me the idea to produce this podcast. Um, because of them, this podcast will be ad-free for all time and free to everyone. So if you enjoy it, if you can afford going out and getting one cup of coffee a day and it doesn't break the bank, please think about subscribing to the Patreon. There's more content over there, and you can find it at patreon.com slash George Beaker. Thank you, and remember, no matter what happens, something will. Over now. And finally, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, add some stars. Wherever you get this stuff, let's bump those algorithms, because we've only just begun.